Blessed is our God always, now and ever, and into ages of ages. Amen. O Christ our God, look down upon those who are called by thy name. Illumine our hearts and minds, that we may know thee, the only true God. And in doing so, may we bring honor, praise, thanksgiving, and worship unto the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, now and ever, and unto ages of ages. Amen. My friend, John, it's all yours. Thank you, Father. Huh. I was talking to uh, Subdeacon Matthew just a second ago, and I, he asked how it, how, it, how it worked getting all my notes together for this talk and such. And I told him what, what usually happens has happened is that I, I write these notes and I think, I've got it. And then as soon as I arrive at the scene, I realize this is totally inappropriate. Uh, <laughs> so I, I, I'll... I'll be in and out of these notes during this talk. I, I, you, if any of you have heard of me, it's probably because I'm famous as a Harry Potter, Twilight, Hunger Games, uh, you know, geek. Uh, Time Magazine has called me the Dean of Harry Potter Scholars, which is obviously a very narrow field. But um, uh, I want to introduce this talk by saying that when I talk about those books, my only ambition is to answer the question, why do people love these books the way they do? Because they're, they're, there's a mania about these books. And any exploration of those books has to get to that question. And as Orthodox Christians in the, Orthodox Christians in the 21st century, we have a, a, a similar fundamental question, which we usually overlook, <laughs> but which should be at the heart of everything that we talk about. And that is, why are there no American saints? Um, I mean, we think that the big questions facing Christianity in the 21st century are things like, gay marriage and abortion and small government, big government, these kind of things. And those things are important, clearly. But if there were a host of American saints, men and women that were fully realized in Christ, wonder-working saints, either in their own lifetime or in their relics at their death, all of those other questions would have an immediate resolution. <laughs> As people would say, oh, this person who is a perfection, a, a human um, icon has pronounced on what those things, what the answers to those questions are, we defer to that person's wisdom. But as Orthodox Christians and, and the community, Christian community in general does not uh, seem very different than the non-Christian community in terms of everything from divorce rate, all this kind of thing, um, our views on these large issues are just considered to be another voice in the crowd. So we have to ask ourselves why aren't there any American wonder-working saints? And, and as a, a personal point of reference, forget the social thing, we want to become Orthodox saints. We want to become uh, images of God growing in his likeness. Uh, what's keeping us from that accomplishment in this life? Uh, now I go back to my notes. Where was I? Um, the answer to this question is, I think, uh, simple, but like most simple answers, very difficult. And that it requires a conversion or a metanoia of sorts, a change of mind, change of heart. And that we have to come to terms with what a human being is, what a man is. I'm going I'm to use man and human being interchangeably. Women, please forgive me that. Um, I'm obviously of that age that I, you know, I, I grew up in that, that uh, sexist linguist thing. Um, we have forgotten what a man is. We have forgotten God, uh, not only his existence, but what he is. And we no longer practice or know the necessary means and accept the grace of, graces available to know him in his church. So that's a simple answer, is we have to remember what man is. We have to remember God and who he is. And we have to labor to make ourselves more accepting and receiving to the graces that are available to us, especially in this, really, the 11th hour. Um, I point all this out because the question I'm supposed to address today about fasting is in light of the Eucharist. I mean, why do we fast? How do we fast? It can only be answered, I think, in the context of the larger question about human sanctity in our place and time. We fast in brief to recall ourselves to our real human condition and to remember ourselves, quite literally as members, distinct persons rather than individual entities. And that's a distinction I'm going to be hammering on for a little while here. 
of the body of Christ. I hope today to do three things, though very briefly and not very professionally. Forgive me, this is not going to be uh, Lasky, Ramonides, Inares. This is not going to be a theological thing. Um, I'm the Harry Potter guy. You, you got, you, you know, you're, you're down here on the second tier, right? Um, I'm going to review Orthodox teaching about man, God, and the means to him in the church. That's obviously going to be a fire hose which, with, with mistakes that Father will have to correct in, in the following weeks. I will discuss how fasting and feasting are essential parts of our shared hope of life in Christ and of our possible departure from or victory over the defining errors of our age. And I want to recall, most importantly, how the Eucharist is our compass and model for every food decision we make, both in the fast and what is sometimes called ordinary time or life outside of the fast. All right. That was the introduction. Are we still all here? Still all here. Whew. But they're almost out of food. Mary, bring one more food. This is great. Where's, do not, oh, they're, when they're done eating, they're going to actually start listening. All right. Um, probably the hardest thing for us to remember is what a man is. Because we are taught in school that man is essentially um, something organic, by which I mean not something that doesn't have pesticides or chemicals, but something that has nitrogen, hydrogen, carbon, and oxygen, um, and that uh, he's a happy accident of evolutionary processes over many thousands of millennia, uh, and that uh, we live, we die, we're worm food. Um, that idea of what man is is hammered uh, into us not only in our education, um, it's in many of our churches, not this one, praise God, um, <laughs> And in our advertising, which defines our popular world, which is that we're a desire-driven animal that wants pleasures more than anything else. And that uh, pleasures are our hallmark as bodies. Right? We're going to make our body happier. Um, that idea of what man is is contrary entirely to the idea uh, that's revealed to us in the church, in Christ's church, both in the incarnation and in the experience of the fathers. What man is, according to the fathers, is a body-soul unity. And in that, that body-soul unity, toes to nose, they call it a psychosomatic, you know, one. Um, in that, we are an icon of God's essence and his energy. There's a visible aspect to us, which is knowable, visible, etc., perceivable. And there is an invisible aspect to us, which is also, some, in some sense, knowable, but not uh, in, in a tactile way, not in a, in a perception way. Um, in addition to that, though, that body-soul unity, these invisible, invisible aspects, we have a, 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 um, a part of us which is not ephemeral. We have a part of us which is eternal. If you go, if you go through the New Testament and concordances, uh, you, can, you can count the big words by how many pages these words take in the concordance or whatever. The biggest words, the biggest nouns in Scripture are God. No surprise, right? Um, Man, no surprise there. Uh, king, that was, that was that kind of surprising. King was number three, but number four is heart. Heart. Um, and that's a curious thing. So we think of heart as being something sentimental um, or something cardiac, like a big pump in your chest or whatever. But the heart in Scripture, especially when our Lord uses the phrase cardia, you know, he talks about the heart. He's talking about your inner essence, the, this divine aspect within you, really the basileo, the kingdom, the ruling power within you. And this divine aspect is not yours. <laughs> it's transpersonal, as they say. It is something like your conscience. The word conscience means shared knowing. I wish my conscience was mine because then it wouldn't speak to me after I've done something stupid, right? It would have come up right before I did something stupid and said, Oh, no, 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 you want to do that, you know. Instead, it's there to say, wow, that was, that was really dumb. You're going to have to do the old paklon before the wife for that one, you know. I mean, that, I mean, that um, this transpersonal faculty of heart or mind, it's sometimes called the intellect, but it's not cranial, it's cardiac. It's the eye of the heart. Intellectus is the Latin translation for noose which is what the Greek fathers call this, the noetic faculty, the neptic or watchful faculty of the human person. This is something that's in every one of us, and it's quite literally the logos or the word of God in us. Right? When we come here to church, it's because we have come to identify <laughs> with that idea, that, that logos, which is the fabric of reality. And we want 
to identify entirely with that. Not our historical body, soul, accidental person. I was, I was talking to Subdeacon Matthew about this before we did this. Is, you know, there's a part of us which is with the saints every moment, this heart. And there's part of us that's 20th and 21st century Oklahoma or New York, Pennsylvania, California, wherever you come from or whatever. And that part of you is ephemeral. It's important because it's really the face of Christ. It's the image of God. But the likeness of God is this faculty logos within us. So if we can remember that, that we're this body-soul unity that is, this, that is aimed at realizing this heart within us, this Christ. Right? And sanctity, as St. John Chrysostom says, is becoming a little Christ within Christ. All right. Oh, that was a lot. That's man. All right. On to God. All right. Wow, that was, I mean, I should, I should say that we talk about becoming saints. St. Sarah and Seraph says, we, you know, our, our purpose as human beings is to acquire the Holy Spirit. C.S. Lewis talking about science says that Really, we want to conform the soul to reality. And the, and the patristic consensus is that becoming a saint means being an image of God, but growing in his likeness. And all of these things assume you understand that what man is, this body, soul, unity with this heart, which is Christ. What is God? All right, now if you get the man thing, we gotta, then we've got to get the God thing before we get the relationship down. All right? The main thing, the God thing, is um, in a way easier and harder. Uh, the first thing about God that you have to know is that um, God is unknown and he is known. He is transcendent, totally other, and he is imminent, closer to us than our own breath. And that contradiction is what makes God God and makes, us, it makes him incomprehensible to us. How can you be both totally other and then within me and greater than me? An inside bigger than the outside, as it were. God reveals himself to us in his creation and in his revelations of self to the prophets and the saints. We know them both. Uh, we know from both creation and, the, and his uh, revelations that he is an essence, by which I mean that he is transcendent, ineffable, totally other, and energies, imminent, creative, the cause of everything existent, each moment nearer than our own breath. We know this from uh, uh, St. Paul says in Romans, in one of the most mysterious passages in Scripture, St. Paul says in Romans, for the invisible, he, he's talking about how, how pagans cannot be excused for not knowing God. Right? That, that if someone denies God, they're, they're to be dismissed as being, you know, because they, they have evidence. He says, for the, indiv the invisible things of him, of God, from the creation of the world are clearly seen. He means visible being understood by the things that are made, that every single visible thing testifies to God, even, he says, his eternal power and Godhead, so that they who deny him are without excuse. Now, when he says eternal power and Godhead, he means the eternal power, his energies, and his Godhead, his essence. Both his transcendence and his imminence are known in every created thing. And he doesn't explain that sentence at all. That's the mind blower, right? <clears throat> We're all doing the, huh? <laughs> what? We're looking through the notes. There's got to be something missing here, right? You know, is, there, is there a lacuna, a little absence in the text there? No, because he assumes that everybody there is nodding their head. All the Christians in the room are doing the, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> and we're left doing the, I don't, you know. I, anyway, on to that. We, got, we have, what is he talking about? He's talking about the polarity without duality in every created thing. That we have a male and a female. We have a night and a day. Okay, we have a front and a back. All of, our, all of the spectrum of perceived things, hard and soft, um, uh, near and far, uh, light and dark, all of these things are a polarity without duality that we perceive, and we can only perceive it because we're at the res this word within us, this logos which defines us, is at the mean of all of that, that spectrum. All right? You can't understand light and dark unless you've come to their resolution somehow and recognize all the, that whole spectrum of it. All right? And so everything in the world speaks to, and this, this, this polarity without duality, speaks to God being both transcendent and imminent. I'm already going on too long here. Um, we know, too, that God is a trinity. Of, in addition to his being this, this 
essence and energy, that he's a trinity of relations or hypostases that, that or persons. And this is probably the biggest obstacle to understanding God, I think, and understanding what a human being is, is that we don't understand ourselves or God as persons. Persons comes from the Greek word for uh, prosopon, which means literally facing. All right? And that you don't, you don't, a person is somebody that faces another person. He understands himself distinctly as self, but he's only a person so much as he faces another and is known by that other as someone who is facing him. In effect, a person is someone in relation. There is no reality in Christian theology without relation. That's why we don't have a God who's a transcendent monad. That's why we don't have a God which is this duality. We have a God who is a trinity in loving relation. The hypostasis is also a Greek word for a, a person in relation. All right? We don't know God in himself. We don't know what that substance and essence is that these three persons share, but we know that they are persons in relation <laughs> and that we are, persons, we are persons fully only so much as we are in loving relationship. And most fully we are loving in loving relationship so much as we identify with this logos, which is that principle of relationship itself. When St. John the Divine says that God is love, he's talking about this principle of relationship. When you have become fully that God who is loved by identifying with that logos within you, then you are that, that close to becoming divine. So much as you insist on your individual reality, rather than your personhood in Christ. Your membership in the body of Christ as this Logos identity that you have, then you are separated from Christ and his church. And this is a problem for us as Americans. Okay, I, speak to, I speak to that as someone who did six years in the Marine Corps, I, as my family's been here since the 1630s. Um, I'm a patriot. But as Americans, the defining quality of Americans is a, a pride. We, we, kind of a, we have a weird thing about pride. Um, every other civilization says pride, dangerous. You know? so, oh, we still, we're, I'm proud about this. I'm proud of being proud. You know? um, and that we're individuals. Our individuality is what we like. Not our personality, not our personhood, but our defining differences rather than where we are joined. That's a problem. Okay, how does, how does man relate to God in his church, obviously? Man relates to God in his church, which is his mystical body and time-space reality, in which man's divine faculty or aspect is nurtured or fostered by the mysteries as a person or member rather than an individual believer. So much as we succeed in loving God and neighbor as self, transcending the delusional distinction of subject and object in Christ, and ourselves as self-creating existences or individuals, we acquire the Holy Spirit, we conform the soul to reality, and we grow in his likeness. Right? We have to come into the church to become members of that church. And as we grow in our personhood, in relationship to one another, all the other members, and in Christ thereby, we become perfect as human beings. And our true distinctness as persons comes forth. So much as we try to grasp the outside individuality, we actually lose it because the heart of that real distinctness is in our personhood within Christ. I, I'm sure many of you have had that experience in your faith. That when, before you were a Christian, you were trying to do this and gain that and get the, this certification and, and get the nice car, this, that, and the other. And, and then when you became a Christian, all of a sudden, those things sort of fell away, and yet who you really were came forth very easily. You didn't need the exterior things so much. Okay. <laughs> Back to the notes that I'm not, I'm not reading from. Right? Okay. Um, what part does fasting play in all this? Um, a big part. I guess I, I wouldn't have started this talk, right? Uh, Really, we grow up with the idea, maybe your mother and your grandmother told you, you are what you eat, you know, garbage in, garbage out type thing. And that, I want to say to that, not really, you know, not really. If anything, you are, we are what we think and believe, okay? The invisible aspect of ourselves shapes the visible aspect of ourselves. Our, conce our concepts of the world shape who we really are. And there's a, a, a Father Pisios said the same thing, that you are what you think. 
right? But I'm going to take that one step further and say, you are what you think about food, right? Because our core ideas that define who we are are about our relationships to the world, to one another, our neighbor, to creation, to God, are in our food ideas. If you think, if you come to the Eucharist and you're thinking about calories and nutrients, we got a problem. We got a problem, right? Because um, you're talking about your individual, you know, body self as you approach the host. Got issues here. Your, your relationship is not right with God. If you eat and you're only concerned about getting yours and you're not concerned about your neighbor, you have, you have no concept of hospitality, then your relationships or food, food are skewed from the correct ones. And if your idea about food is only about what you like to eat, then your relationships with the environment, which is how, what you do when you eat, is you're making some relationship with the environment, with creation itself, are also off-centered. So you are how you think about food, I think, more than about anything else. All right. So let's, let's just go back to fasting. What is fasting? Um, I, I, I promise this wasn't going to be about Lossky, Romanides, or, or Yanaris, but I, I want to quote this one passage from Christos Yanaris because um, it's, it's on your shelf in the back, so I can say, look, it's, it's right over there. It's right over there. I, 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 this is not coming from my esoteric bookshelf. Your father thinks this is important, too. All right? um, he writes in The Freedom of Morality that asceticism, I, I, here, fasting is a type of asceticism. We're not eating everything that we want to eat when we want to Thanksgiving is coming, folks, right? Right in the middle of the fast. Ah, right? Um, that asceticism, he writes, is not an individual work of merit, an act of constancy in observing some objective code of behavior or obedience to commandments laid down by some impersonal law or conventional authority. It isn't obedience. We'll come back to that. Christian asceticism is above all an ecclesial act and not an individual matter. It is the changing of our nature's individual mode of existence, our historical person, into the person, a personal communion and relationship, a dynamic entry into the community of the life of the body of the church. The aim of asceticism and of fasting is to transfigure our impersonal natural needs and desires into manifestations of the free personal will which brings into being the true life of love. Because we call love that full relationship, that elision of subject and object in Christ. Fasting. How is that that? How is fasting going to achieve that personal advancement? Well, as you may have noticed, you don't get to make any of the fasting rules. I mean, you may go to Father and say, how about we add turkey this year? Um, and he says, bad idea. Because the entire point of fasting is that the food decisions are made by the body of Christ, not the single believer. Yeah, I mean, my very good friends who are Catholic, the great tragedy of, of Vatican II in some respects is that they, they basically dis, dis, the, what remnants of fasting tradition they had inside their church. But I could understand why they did it. Because the de facto reality on the ground was they were fasting as individual believers. I'm giving up chocolate for Lent. I'm doing this or that. And it was an individual <laughs> aspect rather than an ecclesial act. While it was a great loss to the Catholic communion and to traditional Christians everywhere, when the Catholic Church sort of threw away fasting, um, you could see why they did it because it had become something other than what it was meant to be. Um, and if so much as you choose to fast on your own terms and your own parameters, you miss the point. Right? This is about somebody else's rules. Okay? It's an exercise in obedience, the conformity of the personal soul, all of us together, to directions of personal God in his mystical body, the church. How about, how about this one? Why do we have restrictions on animal food, wine, and oil? And that just seems totally arbitrary, right? I mean, we can eat ding-dongs and soy, you know, tofurkey and all these other things, but why can't we eat wine olive oil, and uh, animal foods. It's not arbitrary. Go back to Romans 1.20. Everything in creation reflects God's essence and his energy, this, this, this polarity without duality in God. He's, he's a person of qualities. We see that in space, time, matter, energy, subject, and object. Everything in the world speaks to God's polarity without duality, this, this simultaneous transcendence and imminence. The fasting rules are a restriction 
of extremes in food qualities in the first centuries of the church. That basically, if you're living in Palestine for the first three or four centuries, the extremes on your dietary spectrum in food are going to be on the, on the expansive or relaxing side, that's going to be wine and oil. That's going to be as, as rich and as, as, as uh, expansive or liberating a food quality as you can get. And on the contractive side, you've got all the animal foods, harder cheeses, meats, this kind of thing. Things that have, that foods that, because they were animals, had an identity, right? Had a logos that was specific to that animal that wars with your logos identity as a human being. And so we see there's foods that, that if you're outside and it's really cold, what do you want? You want foods that are really warm and hearty. And if you're really hot, you want foods that are cold and relaxing. We have this spectrum of expansive and contractive foods that you see in traditional cuisines. They talk about them in the Far East as yin and yang. In the Mediterranean, it's hot and cold, dry and moist. It's four element theory. But these cuisines are both um, reflections and supports to a logos understanding of the world because the logos is the resolution of those contraries and when they talk about yin and yang or the four elements they're talking about their resolution in the center okay in the center the origin is always Christ but it's a qualitative spectrum and we find that the fasting rules are if you get rid of the wine and the oil and the super expansive foods, and you get rid of the animal foods as well, what you're left with are grains and vegetables. The Daniel diet, if you will. Right? And in that, you come closer to the center. You have some peace. You get rid of what St. John Kronstadt and St. Nikolai Volumovich have called the passionate foods. The foods that, by being on this, this back and forth swing, if I, have, if I have a big steak, then I want a thing of ice cream. You know, because you're, you're going to balance these Things back and forth. If I've got salty chips, I want a beer with that or whatever. And you, we're going back and forth with these extreme qualities means that we don't have peace. We don't have a stillness within us. So that when we come to church for the, for the greater prayers during the fast, we're still if we're not fasting, we're coming, we're coming on this, this uh, hobby horse, this swing of qualities. Instead, we eat more peaceful foods. We eat probably less of it. All right? And we, it makes it easier for us to pray. Right? Less passionate. All right, Whew. but here's even better. These qualities of foods, when you perceive them, I mean, this is one of the funniest things to me. When you, when you talk about food to Americans, they talk about calories and nutrients almost exclusively, right? I don't like carbohydrates. I like proteins. I, I like, you know, calcium. Got to have calcium in this. And uh, that's, that's low-cal diet soda or whatever. All of those things are invisible, Maybe unless it's labeled on the box or the can or whatever. It's invisible. I mean, I look at that, I look at that, if that were a real pumpkin and I look at that pumpkin, I couldn't tell you what its carbohydrate or calorie content is. It's impossible for me to use that mental framework in the moment of choosing my foods. Right? But when you look at food in terms of its qualities, you know, what a pumpkin is, when it grows, how fast it grows, how you can, how you can prepare it so that it's sweet and warming and nourishing, then you're thinking of it qualitatively. And that is not a cranial perception. That is a cardiac perception. That basically, when you're choosing foods in terms of their qualities, which is what the fasting rules largely make us do, and traditional cuisines make us do, we are looking at the world as if it is an icon. So we can see the essence and energies of God the way Paul tells us in Romans 1.20 that we can we begin to have this cardiac exercise as we think about our foods and what's appropriate, we are fostering the very life we're coming to church to receive and to take part in. St. Maximus the Confessor talks about this at great length, and, I, and um, this is kind of stuff I bore father with and, and Paul and Matthew with when they come to my house. Um, but St. Maximus the Confessor says there are three steps to perfection in Christ, to sanctity. And the first one is here. You know, being, you know, the moral life, you know, and, and that's coming to church, um, participating in the body of Christ. The next step, he says, is seeing God everywhere. Basically, Romans 1.20. Seeing God, the inner essences, the lagi, the, the inner essences of things everywhere. Well, that's impossible for us. We think everything's made up of matter and energy. We're not looking for its logi. And the next part, he says, is to see God himself, theosis. Right? But you can't get to the one without the second one. Well, thinking about food this way is 
junior varsity is just, just sort of like uh, t-ball, um, uh, noesis, a way of perceiving things in terms of quality, seeing, beginning to see God everywhere. Right? But if you don't start there, then you're left with your education, which is to say that that's not possible, and you can't get to the third step because the second step is forbidden to you, is blocked to you. St. Maximus also talks about God's providence in that every bit of pleasure that you have is balanced with a, a, uh, a just as great an experience of pain. Right? So all the great pleasures that were allowed come to us basically through his church. You know, even our physical pleasures, our sexual pleasures, if they're blessed by the church, then they're blessed and they don't necessarily have a corresponding physical pain consequent or psychic pain that are consequent to it. Um, the reason that the, the church, you know, that frowns on fornication, homosexuality, all of these things, adultery, isn't because we're a bunch of prudish nasties. It's because in love we recognize the consequences of that activity outside the body of Christ, which are the destruction of the human person. And it's, not, it's not prudish legalism or some juridical hang-ups that we have about sexuality. It's that we know what happens to people who do those things. It's, it's a loving correction rather than a, um, I know better than you do, listen to me, buddy. Um, but St. Paul talks about that, in, in St. Paul, St. Maximus talks about this pleasure-pain balance, and sure enough, you know, the foods that we really like are right, way out there on this periphery. You know, the, the super sugary, super rich, oily, you know, gonzo foods, and the biggest possible steak, you know, the, the, the cow you keep in your backyard. You know what I mean? Um, I mean, these are the foods that we really like. All right, but they're the ones that will cause us in a way the most grief because they'll take us away from that center of origin in Christ. If you've just eaten Mary's meal, you know that I'm not an ascetic. Um, I, I, I eat her food at breakfast, lunch, and dinner, whatever I love to eat. I love the pleasures of eating. But what happens instead of having this broad spectrum of eating, you get a depth and a height of eating inside the centered foods, things that you've never eaten before or whatever, the, the, the incredible range of foods and traditional cuisines that in America, which is basically a salt and sugar spectrum, you know, just bouncing back and forth between salt and sugar. I mean, when you come to the center and actually taste real food rather than just how it's seasoned or sweet, um, then you have a rich, you actually have a palate. It takes about three weeks for your palate to come back. Um, anyway. Fasting is also an antidote or guardian against the primary errors of our age. The primary error was there, I'm going to give you four. Okay. Individualism. Okay. We've got beaten that to death largely. These are choices made by a person. Our fasting choices are made as a person within Christ, not rules chosen by ourselves. Fasting is a correction against materialism. The world is not energy and matter, calorie and nu nutrient choices, but food qualities that we can actually see and use. Now, I'm not saying that food is not matter and energy and nutrient. Obviously, you can put food in an autoclave, burn it up, and you can get that way as cal calorie and nutrient quantities are. But they're useless to us. They're only useful to us so much as those energy and matter are aspects of God's, a reflection of God's essence and energy. All right. Rationalism. Ration rationalism is probably the biggest thing. You celebrate the life in your brain, in your head. All right. Um, but that rationalism is what Christ says he's not interested in. He calls them the logismos, you know, the logismi, your thoughts. He says they darken your heart. And that's what he's about because that's who he is. <coughs> but when you celebrate the logismos and you're doing rational calculations about what's an advantage for me? What foods should I be in? What nutrient dense organic quality foods? I, mean, I work at Whole Foods, so I can say this stuff, right? <laughs> that, what, that rational calculation is driving us from our noetic identity our life in our hearts. And finally, the biggest conflict to our, the biggest holdback for us as Christians is something called moralistic therapeutic deism, MTD. Okay? That is the real Christian life in America. It's sort of an emptied out Christian church. Moralistic, we want to be nice people. Therapeutic, we want to be healthy people. Right? And deism, if things get really bad, we can pray to God. Who's way out there, we don't really know who he is or whatever, and so moralistic therapeutic deism is a de facto state religion of the United States, as much as it remains a Christian country. It's an absolutely emptied out, it's not transformative at all. It's a celebration of the individual, historical, ephemeral self. Fasting is a correction to that. 
because it is authentic spirituality, not healthy mindedness. Healthy mindedness, William James wrote in 1900 in the varieties of the religious experience. He said, healthy mindedness is the principal religion of America. St. Paul, talking about healthy mindedness, said, carnal mindedness is death. St. Paul is not going to get that straightforward. I have a hard time with St. Paul. Even with the Chrysostom, you know, you know, gloss on it, I, I struggle with him. But carnal mindedness is death, he said. Spiritual mindedness is life and peace. If you're thinking about food from a carnally minded way, St. Paul has a word for you. It starts with a D, you know? It's, I mean, it's over. You know, you're, you're basically listening to the serpent song, eat this and you'll never die. And it's wrong. It's a lie then, it's a lie now. But spiritual mindedness, thinking about your nutrient, you know, you're, you're fostering your heart and your life in Christ. That's reality. All right, on to the third part. Eating in light of the Eucharist. Fasting is an extension of eating God's body and blood as communion. We receive communion not to nourish our individual bodies, but as a distinct, but as distinct persons or members of the body of Christ. That should be a no-brainer to you. Have you ever seen anybody at communion say, I'd like seconds? <laughs> right? Mm. Or, boy, that tasted good today, Father. That was out of drill that one. We don't think, as we come to communion, how this is about my body. It's about my life in Christ. We commune after refocusing our heart on communal identity in Christ's heart via confession of our lapses into individuality or separateness, and by fasting to reorient ourselves on Him rather than our own desires. We eat in communion the Logos Himself, becoming the Word in His church, not some qualitative shadow of the Word in the world, but the reality Himself. Right? We're not looking for some um, obedience to God and on the spectrums. We're not looking for you know, the cuisine, which is a larger aspect of God, but we get the actual thing. We get God the Word in that. It's the medicine of immortality, as the fathers say, versus an individual, material, rational, physical health concern. There can't be anything more distinct than that. And that, I propose for you today, is your model for every food choice that you make. When St. Paul writes about everything having to be reflected about your life in Christ, to include what you eat and drink, I think this is what he means. There are three eatings in the life of a Christian. There is the Eucharist, the Eucharist, primarily forever. Right? It is the focus of our worship and our prayer life. It is our primary means to theosis. You may think that's overstatement, but I, I think in the church, the Eucharist is really the beginning and the end of our hope in Christ. Fasting is the first, if you imagine this is like a rock dropped in the pond, right? <coughs> The rock is the Eucharist. It's the origin. It's the, it's, it's the center of the circle. That Maybe you can't see it all the time, but there it is. It's what defines everything else. Fasting is the first wave out. It's the first extension of sacramental life into the world, eating with what the fathers call the mind of Christ. And then there is the traditional cuisines and customs, which are both this, this four-element yin-yang idea of food, but it's also about hospitality. I don't know about you. I, I, grew, up, I grew up in the Episcopal Church. And, um, you know, the, the old jokes, you know, where there's four Episcopalians, there's a fifth, you know, that kind of thing. I mean, oh, God. I mean that, that um, I grew up, and, and we had good parties, but it wasn't really about hospitality. Not until I became an Orthodox Christian, and I began to learn about, you know, from people like the Ukrainians I met in Houston, or the, the Russians I met in Rochester, the Greeks I met, and, and the Lebanese everywhere, right? Um, <laughs> Did I learn about sacrificial hospitality? That when someone comes to your home, food. And, and if you don't eat the food, you have basically insulted them in a way that you couldn't do any other way. Because when we eat together, it's a shadow of the Eucharist, of our shared life. What brings us into existence moment to moment? That is... An ex again, an extension of the Eucharist, when we eat together upstairs, and we experience the body and blood as, as one body with members of that one body there, then we know hospitality. It must bleed out into our lives that way. The agony of the modern world is we are what we think and believe about food. We believe that food is fuel for individual human body machines, 
Calories and nutrients are invisible, so the model is useless in a moment of food choices, as I've said. Therefore, because we can't use our thinking for that, our default mechanism for choosing foods is what the Bible calls the belly, our desires, our passions. The two, and so the, the person was upside down. Instead of the heart telling the will and the rational mind what to think, and the, and the belly, the passions, the desires, what to desire, we have the desires telling the mind what to think, and the heart is used like a shovel for you know, business decisions or something. I'm not sure what. <laughs> the two modes that we have are eat to live, healthy eating, of our individual person, individual you know, entity, or love to eat, which, which has been captured by like beer as tastes great, less filling. Right? That's how we think about food. It's either going to taste great, yay for me, I love it, or less filling, it's not going to fill me up, make me fat or undesirable. Right? That's going to be physically disadvantageous to me. But the dietary law of the modern age, this is the dietary law of the modern age, tastes great, less filling, and all of its errors. It fosters, it's not only a product of these errors, but it brings them forward in each one of us every day. Individualism, materialism, relativism, etc., all come from that. It's the origin not only of physical plagues like obesity, cancer, heart disease, all those things, but it's the cause of spiritual vacancy and the dissipation of our communal life inside the church. All right. Conclusions. If you've weathered all this, it, 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 it all finished dessert long ago. I, this is amazing. I, um, the, three, the three forgotten things is what a man is. What a man is essentially is his heart, which is because that's where Christ is within him. What is God? God is, as much as we can know him, he is something transcendent and imminent. And we can know him both through the revelations of the church, the Palamite theology, as well as um, in, in his creation. And that everything visible reveals who he is. And the means to God is our life in the church as persons rather than individual believers. The great gap between traditional Christians and modern Christians is that everything about a traditional church speaks to our being one body and everything with, with polarity, right? But, but, but not duality, right? I mean, you go, you, go to, you go to churches in Greece and this and that, you see that the, the men stand on one side, the women stand on the other side. That's not about separation. That's about, a, you know, a, this, this, this is the body of Christ. This is an icon of the church. Right? It's just as it a front and a back. It has a left and a right, and it's all resolved right at the point where Father comes out on the ambo carrying the body and blood of Christ. Heaven and earth are joined right there. And all those things, male, female, Jew, Greek, are resolved. Anyway. What fasting is, first, it's a conformity and obedience to the mind of Christ in the church, not about individual ideas and pieties, what you're going to give up. The rules are not arbitrary restrictions, but they're the cutoff of these qualitative extremes so that we come closer to the center or origin of things. And fasting is an extension of Eucharistic thinking in preparations for the graces of the feast. And now that we've entered into the Philippian fast here at Holy Ascension, okay, we're waiting here for the birth of Christ in the world and his rebirth in us together as his body here in Norman, Oklahoma. We're awaiting that, and so we have to extend our Eucharistic thinking into that to prepare ourselves for that great feast and the great graces available to us in that moment. The Eucharist is the origin of all right thinking about food. God himself is in the body and blood of Christ, and I, I don't need to gloss that. That in itself is really the whole miracle of the, the church surviving in the world. It is eaten as a member or person, not as an individual believer, and it is eaten to nourish our transpersonal aspect, our heart, not our individual physical nutrition. You are what you eat, perhaps only when you approach the communion cup. Right? Because there it is, the body and blood of Christ, your heart, and you'll eat that body to become a greater part of that body. I suggest that there's an alternative thinking, in conclusion, to eat to live and love to eat, and that is that we eat to love. Traditional cuisine and customs from the word Tao cultures are a reflection and reinforcement of God, man, and church orthodoxy, which is to say right thinking, believing, and worshiping. And to make that point, I want to talk about this, this other mysterious passage in Scripture. We talked about Romans 1.20 already. 
Uh, the other one for me is the reverse Robin Hood aspect of God, uh, where, where Christ tells us in Matthew 13, 12, for whomsoever, whosoever hath, to him shall be given, and he shall have more abundance. But whosoever hath not, from him shall be taken away even what he hath. I don't know about you, but when I was a kid, when they read that, I thought, whoa, 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 must, must be a typo in there somewhere. Um, the guys that have it all get more, and the folks that don't have it get, get, get what they have taken away? What is that about, right? I mean, I can see FDR spinning around, you know, whoa, you know, we're supposed to take away, whoa, what's happening here? I, um, modern man who thinks and eats as a materialist, an individualist, a carnally healthy-minded atheist, in effect, is divorced from what is most real, God and our means to him in the mysteries of his church. He's a person who has not. He makes his food decisions in to order to live forever, for his physical health, for the continuation of this individual reality. My, Modern man, forgetting himself in God, loses not only eternal life, but also his physical health. This is one of the great ironies of our time. A, a, a wonderful historian, Harvey Levenstein of, of American Eating, in a book called Paradox of Plenty, Oxford University Press, the paradox of plenty is we have all this food, we have every possible food we could possibly want, and yet we're sick as dogs because of what we eat. Whoa. I mean, one of the first people to, ever, to die of food-related illnesses that isn't related to a famine. The Orthodox Christian, struggling to remember himself within God's church, has the hope of immortality in Christ, and as a side effect of eating with a sacral mind, sacramental mind in the fast and ordinary time, the Orthodox Christian, as a rule, has much better physical health. He who has, okay, gets even more, though he's not even pursuing that. I mean, your, your idea about eating shouldn't be about living longer. It should be about living deeper towards eternity rather than, you know, a dirtive. But that, ironically, eating that way means that you live longer. I mean, I, I, I know that my archbishop is uh, diabetic, from type 1 diabetic, I think, and um, has horrific heart disease. The man should have died years and years and years ago. Why? Is he still alive? I, maybe he's just pure meanness. He's kind of a rough guy. But um, <laughs> he's probably watching this, you know. Um, but he says, and I believe he's right, it's because he's been a true monastic. He's eaten relatively little, and he's eaten according to the traditional rules of the church. Um, that's what's allowed him as a diabetic with heart disease to live as long as he has. Anyway. Um, and not that, he's, not, that he's ever, not, not that he ever thinks that when he eats his food. I, um, he's a real gourmand. He's a good Greek. You know, he, 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 loves, he loves his food. He likes my wife a lot, too, when she cooks for him. <laughs> um, the life as an image of God, who is the God of love and relationships, is best lived with a mind focused on communion with God in himself, with our neighbors, and with his created world, all of which have a food foundation in the Eucharist, in our hospitality, and in our meal choices. One of my good friends at Whole Foods Market, Mark Dixon, said to me when I was uh, much younger, uh, working in Houston, that there is no food without relationships. And there are no relationships without food. If you understand that you're trying to grow as a person, which is only about relationships, you begin to see the centra centrality of getting it right about food. It's not a hypochondriac thing. It's not a sentimental thing. It's a pivot in how you think about who you are, about God, man, and his, your life in the church. Eating to love within the church means eating towards our greater life in Christ. And eventually we can pray one part of the answer to the scandal of there being no American saints. Apologies for my mistakes in detail here and overreach. Um, I, I, I can make these mistakes here because I know Father Justin will correct me either immediately or in the following weeks. I recommend, if you want to read something uh, more edifying about fast, that you read Bishop Callisto's uh, essay in the Lenten Triodian, which is magisterial. Um, my best wishes to you all for your edifying nativity fasts 
And I hope that you'll speak to Mary about cooking classes if you're interested in learning more about how to eat with an Orthodox Christian mind and heart. Thank you again.